Since we begin our uh, class today, I'm going to uh, pray and get started because we have always, it seems, limited time and much to cover. So let me pray and we'll dig right in this morning. Lord God, we ask you that you would be pleased to meet us and assist us this morning in all that we do. Lord, we pray that as we give ourselves to the consideration of your word, that you would be pleased to give us understanding. Lord, we pray that you would uh, assist in all that we undertake this morning for your name, for your kingdom, and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to grab a hold of your notes. At the same time, I'm gonna see if somebody can uh, shut this side door for me. And we wanna get, get ourselves in here. Uh, when we start this up, and this is the beginning of our God's Amazing Grace class, one of the things that we're gonna see this morning is, I've noted, it, it is God's Amazing Grace, not just Amazing Grace. Sometimes the focus is so much on grace, we forget that God is the source of it, that God is the one who dis defines this grace. God is the one who dispenses this grace as he pleases. And somehow, sometimes we can supplant the godhood of God with our desire for grace. And so we've, we're gonna go all the way back a few steps even before that. One of the things that is common in the study of philosophy, which we are not going to undertake today, you know, um, is, the, is the idea of epistemology, which means how do we even come to know what we know? How do we know what we know is reliable? What are, what's the source of all that we know. So it's even kind of a step one, and I want us to see from the scriptures that if we don't start in the right place, we end in the wrong place. You know, generally speaking, with every race that is scheduled to be run, the starting line is clearly marked. You don't just get to start where you want. If you choose your own starting line, you're gonna probably lose or be disqualified because you've not run the right amount of distance. Uh, the late John Riesinger used to use this example that has always been so clear in my mind. He said, once on a cold morning, such as we are experiencing here today, he watched his wife put on her coat that was a button sweater and he noticed she caught the first button in the second hole. And he didn't say a word. He let her put the second button in the third hole and all the way down, and she did not realize that she had made a mistake until what? She had got to the very end. She thought they were all right because they all fit perfectly. They were all seemingly rightly spaced apart. Everything seemed right. But it, how many mistakes did she make is the real question. Some would say, well, she made one mistake. But by making one mistake, was not then every button in the wrong hole? Yeah, so depend, she, pretty much everything was flawed because of the flawed beginning. We must start right in order to understand right. Listen as I read from uh, Psalm 25, verse four and five. The psalmist cries out to God and we together with him, God, make me know your ways. Here is that earnest dependence. We do not innately know God's ways. We are dependent on him to enable us, equip us, help us to know his ways. Oh Lord, teach me your paths. If he does not teach them, we will not know them. When it comes to any spiritual and eternal truths, we are absolutely dependent on God for all of it. 
I could even go further. For any truth in this world, we are absolutely dependent on God for it. Some would say, well, what about natural truths? Who is the one who has created all that is in nature? Yes, who is the one who has even given us men the mental capacity to make certain observations and deductions and conclusions from things? God. But we've got to understand that our abilities with regard to the practical world are one thing. Our abilities with regard to spiritual and eternal truths are tremendously flawed. And even though we may have an overestimate, which is usually the condition, an overestimate of the ability of of man and the mind and wisdom of man, God needs to help us with those things. It says this, lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day long. One of the interesting things, and we've talked about it in the past, is sometimes in wrestling with these things and we recognize how wrong men can be. Majority consensus does not make something true. There was a time where it was deemed majority consensus that the earth was flat. Is that correct? It's correct that it was deemed such, but it's not necessarily correct that it is such. Then second, secondarily, so then majority consensus changes. There was a time where it was considered that the earth was the absolute center of the universe. And then as time went by and mathematical calculations and observations, they changed their view to a heliocentric universe, meaning the sun is at the center of the universe, which was also still wrong. The sun is merely at the center of our galaxy, not necessarily the center of the universe. So then what exactly is at the center of the universe? And the answer is, we don't know. And that's an uncomfortable answer for mankind. And they want to be able to somehow come up with the answers all themselves. I mean, if there was, imagine this, I'm going to give an extreme hypothetical scenario. Imagine that somebody proposed the notion that all of mankind somehow evolved from apes. I mean, imagine that. Uh, You know, and and that everything that exists in the universe, uh, all of the astounding order and structure of creation came about by a giant explosion. I mean, who would buy that? You know, none of us have ever bought property and loaded it with dynamite and say, this is how I'm gonna build my house. You know, and and no matter how many times you detonate, it's unlikely you're gonna have a livable dwelling place, right? I mean, it's just crazy. But what happens is men want answers based on their knowledge that don't depend on God. And the problem is, all reality and truth comes from God. All creation comes from God. Prior to creation, I love the way the scriptures begin. It begins as simple as this. In the beginning, God to which men stand up and almost immediately say, prove it. Uh, Prove. God doesn't even struggle, if you read the scriptures, to prove himself. He declares himself. And all that he has seen fit to do declares his handiwork. Okay, and so we've got to understand the starting point of everything is God. And just for a moment, 
And, and time is gonna run on us really quickly this morning, but I just want, I want, to think, want you to think about it. Um, how many galaxies are there? Good, you don't know. Nobody does, because they're still counting and measuring, which makes our galaxy, which is immense in terms of, of miles, minuscule in the universe. And our, and our star, the sun, even more of a little light speck. And then the little fleck of dust that's circling around it that we call Earth. Yeah, and the little whatever breathing dust bag that is me on, the, on top of that little fleck moving around that little speck. And yet... Somehow we think the universe exists by and for us. We've got to get everything a little clearer than that. So I want to go ahead and work our way as best we can through tonight, today's starting notes. We have, first of all, by, and I've, I put them by way of statement and then set the scriptures forth, God's wisdom and knowledge. He is omniscient, which is a word that simply means what? He knows absolutely everything. Everything that has been, everything that is, everything that ever will be, everything that could have been, Everything that he has purposed and designed, God knows absolutely everything. His knowledge is immediate, immediate, where ours is immediate, which means he has within himself eternal and complete knowledge. He's not learning. He's not growing. He's not discovering. That's us. Let me read for you a few verses. Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, his way is perfect, and the word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. Further, in Psalm 147, verse 5, it says this, God is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Ours is measurable right? And maybe over the course of time, that measure grows a bit, and then that measure shrinks a bit, whatever our understanding is. I remember once one of my seminary professors telling me, you know, I have forgotten more of the truth of the Bible than you've ever learned. I thought, I don't know if that's really what you want to say. I mean, you've forgotten the, more of the truth of the Bible, that doesn't put you in a good position. <laughs> you know, if you've forgotten more than I've learned, I still might be better off than you, my friend. Um, uh, but but the, the thought is, God's knowledge is beyond measure. Isaiah 40, verse 28 as well says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary, his understanding is unsearchable. Unsearchable means you cannot trace out the ends of it. You cannot comprehend it, you cannot measure it. God's wisdom is perfect and infallible every time. Now let's, with just a glimpse, and these are simply sample verses that indicate of which the scriptures are replete with passages that teach these things. Also important to note this, if God did not tell us, we would not know him or his truth. That means we are absolutely dependent on him to know him and to know his truth. An example of that for it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 and following. For it is written, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Those who think they are smart, I will show they are not. 
Those who think they have the answers and the solutions, I will ultimately demonstrate to them they're wrong. Goes on to say it simply this way. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? To which you might point to one person or another who seems to have achieved some level of notoriety of intellect in a present age. And the scripture simply says this, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So again, sometimes you, th you think how, how incredible Einstein must have been in his understanding or, or, or so on or maybe you think of somebody else maybe you put your name where others think of Einstein however it works the wisdom of this world is foolish because look what it says in verse 21 for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom So what, what class can someone sit in? What field of study, what endeavor in the efforts of man will ultimately lead him to a right understanding of who is the true God? Now, there is enough revelation of God in nature to show men his existence and to hold men accountable. It demonstrates his existence and his power. But who is he? Who is this God? Leave men to answer that question, and they come up with a lot of answers. You know, and, and, and you, that's why you have all of the different religions and all of the different idolatry in this world. And here's one of the dangers Potentially, we have divisions within what we call Christianity because so many of the expressions of Christianity are a mixture of the wisdom of God revealed in the Word combined with the wisdom of men. We need to learn the wisdom of men has no contribution to make with regard to spiritual and eternal truths. We'll see more. The world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the foolishness, the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Because what's interesting is the very thing that we preach, the world deems foolish, don't they? Wait, you're saying that the whole world was created by one God and then uh, this good and holy God let the whole world fall into sin. Why would he do that? And then eventually he sent his son, his own beloved son, to die on the cross for a bunch of losers or however, you know, and it's just hard to figure out to where the, the, the story of the gospel comes across. Yeah, this does not make sense to me why would God do it this way I can think of a better way that God could have done it man doesn't fall into sin he decides to save without sending his own son to have to suffer why would he do that and the whole why would and all of that presumes that our assessment has any value in these issues that our judgments have something to contribute. They don't. And I'm going to show you that as we go through this morning. Job 36, 26 says this, Behold, God is great, and we know him not. And I, and I, and I love people's most natural response to that. No, we don't. Well, God is great, we know him not. No, 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 we know him, we know him. No, you don't. You know what, we know a sliver. We know but a, a fleeting glance and glimpse. We know not the fullness of his greatness. We're, we're not capable of comprehending it. So let's see a little bit more about human wisdom, knowledge, 
It is foolish, finite, and flawed. In Matthew, we are reminded of this, and it should be putting us in our place. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by the Father. No one knows the Father or the Son except the Father. So that kind of excludes who? Yeah, everybody. So, so, but someone jumps in and says, but I know the Son. Well, how have you come to know the Son? You haven't wrestled with that yet. He goes on to say, and no one knows the Father except the Son. That kind of leaves us on the outs, doesn't it? And what? Anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What does this indicate to us? In order for there to be a knowledge of God, there has to be a revelation of God. Apart from divine revelation, man cannot and will not know God. Now there is a divine revelation in a sense in the gospel and in the scripture, but simply telling someone that doesn't necessarily open their eyes, does it? God must do that, and it shows the limitation. Uh, Job 37, 23 puts it this way. The Almighty, we cannot find him. So how many have sat under a tree, cross-legged, breathing slowly and meditating, and somehow discovered God? None. Nobody finds him. He, in his mercy, finds us and reveals himself to us. He's great in power, justice, righteousness. He will not violate, but we cannot find him. Not only that, we've already seen from Romans 3, we're not righteous, we're not good, and we do not seek him. We do not seek him. We cannot find him. Let's see a little bit more. Proverbs 14. Whenever you are thinking about, and I am thinking about, and this needs to be a careful and humbling and structuring approach to how we grow. Whenever we're studying the scripture, our assumptions and expectations need to be set aside because the scriptures are clear. Proverbs 14 and Proverbs 16, as in your notes there, there is a way that seems right to man. But its way, its end, is the way of death. Which means every conclusion, every solution that a man will come up with from himself, is it the right one? Is it the saving one? Is it the true one? No. So this is very important even in every facet of our study of theology. Sometimes we get a point that's true and then we draw deductions from it logically. And I mean, it's one of the atheist attacks against Christians where they think that they, they prove us to be lunatics by saying, so is your God uh, all powerful and all good? And we say, yes. And they say, well, if he was all good, then there wouldn't be all this evil in this world. And if he was all powerful, he would change it. So the fact that we're living in an evil world with evil people doing evil things proves that there is no God. Ha. No, it does not. Now, God is all good. God is all powerful. But how he is pleased to exercise that and what all goodness and all power actually looks like, you got no clue. And that's, that's, the, that's the struggle. The assumption is, this is what it ought to look like. Well, that's the way that seems right to man. 
don't trust anything that seems right to man. Our thoughts, our contributions are useless. It's all about God's word. First Corinthians 13, or 319 says this, for the world, for the wisdom of the world is folly or foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. What about the difference? How close is the wisdom of God and, and the wisdom of man? I mean, is it possible one out of 10 times I'm right and he's wrong? Hmm. One out of 100, one out of a million, one out of a bigger made up number? You know, the, the fact is, He's always going to be right. And whenever I differ from him, I'm wrong. And the only place that I'm going to be right is when I agree with him. And where he is not spoken and I speak, I might be wrong. Probably am. Let's, let's see this. The example given in Isaiah 55 is something we must not forget. God says through the prophet, for my thoughts are your, not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So again, what's he, what's he, what's he showing a difference from? His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So the way that my brain works and my judgments and my assessments aren't his. And the strange thing is we as men, mankind, are always assessing, judging, considering God based on our thoughts and our ways. And it's not entirely our fault because that's all we got is our thoughts and our ways until we learn to set our thoughts on the side, listen to his thoughts and his way, replacing our thoughts and our ways. And we'll see a little bit more. Uh, Four verse, verse nine says of Isaiah 55, for as the heavens are higher than the earth. Again, I ask you, in spite of the fact that Hubble's been up there for decades and they've now sent the Weber up telescope up that's gonna see even farther and they're projecting it's gonna see the ends, have they seen or measured the ends of the known universe? No. And so, God says, you want to get a sense for how high his thoughts are above our thoughts? How high his ways above our ways? As high as the heavens. But that's not measurable. Yeah. So where does that put you? Right? You know, uh, I mean, I, I, sometimes I think in my mind when we, when we, when we think about the different things that go on um spelling bees maybe you're not the best speller but were you to compete against seven day olds you know gather a bunch of seven day old babies on the stage with you you know in a spelling contest and who gets the most words right i'm hopeful you could pull it off right why why is that because they don't know hardly anything well the 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 difference between a, a baby and you isn't all that vast isn't all that immeasurable i mean i might again replace the babies with mosquitoes you know the, you know, and, and whatever it may be, even in your mind, consider, consider as we approach uh, uh, the, the all-star game, uh, a skills competition. 
between you and infants. You know, you're going to outrun them, out nimble them, out catch them, out throw them every single time because the divide is too great. And those are all understandable divisions. Compared to God, if I said our thoughts are like baby thoughts, I'm still overstating it. Say, but that's a little bit, you're kind of putting, putting us down. Yes. Uh, and again, I ask, is it me? What, what happens, and it's not simply that we get put down, but what happens in this process is God gets put up where he belongs. And how high up? We don't even know. We don't even get him. We don't ever exalt him sufficiently. So we, how are we able to overcome our limitations? Or are we? Men sometimes think, yeah, we've got these weaknesses, we've got these flaws, we're creatures, not the creator, etc. But we can overcome it. Because one of the things they'll say, we were made in the image of man, or God, man was made in the image of God. Yeah, that's in the image and likeness of God. That does not mean we are exactly like God. Today, again, the passage, you're going to see it, and we won't be focusing on it, but Romans 8 is going to say that Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Does that mean he was a sinner? Not at all. Does that mean he had sin? No. So likeness means similarity, not exact sameness. You know, that's why when someone comes along and says, reads those things, says, oh, we're made in the likeness of God. I remember years ago, some television guy who, who's a preacher who's, who's, name is named after money of all things you know it, it was saying you know i was washing my car all shiny here's coming a storm in the sky and i thought oh no i just washed my car hey but i'm just like god so you know what i'm a, get out of here storm you ain't a, you ain't welcome here get out of here and you know what that storm did it went away because i'm in charge because I'm just like God. No, you're not. You don't control the lightning that it hits the mark. He does. You don't control the storms and the wind and the rain. He does. Again, sometimes my, my mind goes to, uh, uh, do you remember Elijah? What did Elijah do when the drought was supposed to end? Did he get up on the mountain and say, all right, rain, I'm telling you right now, you bring it on. Or did he pray? Send a servant, have a look-see. Okay, not yet. What do I do? Continue to pray. Because he knew the power belonged exclusively to God. Oh, oh, that we would understand our place. We are not able. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Here is the book of wisdom written by the man with superior wisdom to all except Christ, Solomon says this, he, that is God, has made everything beautiful in its time and he's put eternity into the hearts of men, yet so that he cannot, cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. Men have some sense that there must be an eternity, some sense there must be an afterlife, but can they come to the answers? of what was before and what will be after. No, they've got a sense of eternity, but they cannot get or come to the answers. What does it say in chapter eight, verse 17? It's all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. I mean, that's, that's some of the fun things. You have maybe Darwin or somebody else later along the way saying, let's sit together and talk about what God or, or how the universe came into existence. Uh, were you there? I mean, uh, uh, what are you going to use uh, to, to extrapolate all of this information? You know, who was there? 
Yeah. The only person who was there at creation was God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so if we want to know how the universe came to be, who has to tell us? God. But just because we cannot know the answer does not mean we won't share an answer. I mean, if the age we're living in has told us anything, you know, well, the data's a moving target, right? This is what we know so far about the pandemic. And, and this is what we know works. And, and everything that works doesn't work, <laughs> right? And, and everything keeps changing and moving. And, and it shows the limitations of men's conclusions. And those, that's about a simple thing, seemingly. But if we can't get the solution and answer to that, how are we going to get issues of origins and eternity? We won't. However much a man, back to 817, may toil in seeking, give all of his energy, all of his intellect, all of his life to seeking, he will not find it out. So how many of them will come up with the right answer? None. Well, what if he says, I found it, Eureka, right? What if he says this? Um... Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Know this, he doesn't know. I mean, this is one of the most challenging things. You don't know how much you don't know. (laughs) And that's that's just something that we, we don't wrestle with. You know, we like to kind of look around and say, "Eh, I'm on the more knowier side of the community. But are you? Because they think they are too. And they have completely different views than you. And um, you may be right on this issue and that, but on the essential things, only God is right with regard to truth and eternity, with regard to spiritual things. 1 Corinthians says this, uh, will foolish men think the wisdom or truth of God to be foolish? Listen to what it says. In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of we, what we preach to save those who believe. The Jews demand a sign, Greeks wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly or foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many were wise according to worldly standards, not many powerful, not many of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to confound the wise, shame the wise, weak in the world to shame the strong, what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not to bring to nothing, the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. And I I, I say that even by introduction to this course. How is it that if you and I have not the innate ability to come to a knowledge of the truth, we have to have it revealed to us by a divine revelation. If I'm saved, how is it that I have become saved? What would be the correct statement? It is because of me that I am in Christ Jesus. Or, it is because of him I am in Christ Jesus. Now, the answer is clear. What did the verse say? Well, let me just read it, verse 10. And because of him, <laughs> you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, if God did not tell us, we would not know him 
or his truth. Jesus uh, says this, uh, or the scriptures tell us this in John 20. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is uh, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What, what is this telling us? If God had not given us his word by his spirit through his chosen men, you wouldn't know. But God has been pleased to make it known. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 even tells us this. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before ages for our glory. So here's the challenge. Well, so here we are in this world with the wisdom of man and somebody comes in and they share with us the gospel. The spiritual truth of the gospel. What is natural man's response to spiritual truth? Well, let's see. Again, I ask the question and I hope you're gonna learn this pattern. I ask the question and then I say, what does the scripture say? Not what seems right to me or seems right to you, but what do the scriptures say? 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Have any of you ever had this experience? You share the gospel with someone, you tell them clearly, you tell them plainly, you tell them lovingly, and they look you straight in the eye and they say, I don't want it, I don't believe it, I don't accept it. And you're thinking, why not? (laughs) This is the gospel that brings life and salvation and hope and peace and reconciliation with God. Why would you not want this? How can you not get this? And they say, I don't believe it. And you're thinking, what's wrong? Here's what's wrong. They're human. Just like you were. How many of us might think, how many times did we hear the gospel (laughs) before God was pleased by his spirit to bring us to respond? We don't know. You know, sometimes we, we, we think, let me keep reading. Um, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness or folly to him. Why? He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Here's the difference. How are we going, what, what's necessary in order to understand spiritual things? Well, he says it just a few verses earlier in laying it out, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 says this. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So the natural person does not understand, does not accept, but when one has what? Received the Spirit of God, they now what? Understand. And in understanding, the Spirit works that gift of faith in which we believe and follow. And so all these pieces begin to put together. Strangely enough, the time has already run upon us. And so I'm gonna have to pray and close out here so that we can uh, be ready for our service. Uh, But we will take this up next week. But the simple thought that I don't want us to to, uh, miss in starting today is, Um, we don't start with committees. We don't start with think tanks. We start with this recognition. Everything that a human being has to contribute 
of our natural human thoughts and ways, expectations, assessments, and assumptions, they are wrong. And if we're going to know who is God, what is his will, what are his thoughts, what he has done, why he has done it, and all these answers to things, it is he alone who can tell us. And so we need to learn to say, I know not but what he has said. We'll consider that more as we take it up next week. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the time that we could spend beginning to introduce this topic this morning. I know that oftentimes the biggest hindrance uh, to laying hold of truth are the uh, traditions that we have inherited from our forefathers, the, uh, the innate sense of knowledge and wisdom and uh, uh, logic that we have within ourselves. But Lord, I pray that we would learn, like humble children, to listen to you, to recognize that every one of your words proves true, and your ways are always right, and that we learn to yield our thoughts, defer our expectations and listen and learn and love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.